going to deliver it to them and going to make sure that they're very happy with that two hours of non-dancing time. So we have a, a, just a typical order here. Reception starts where you might be playing a little bit of you know, background music before you do your introductions. Uh, a lot of times, particularly in the South, people want a blessing before they sit down for a meal, so they do that. Um, during during the, the uh, dinner period, a lot of times they want to do toasted cake cutting, which is a great uh, strategy in terms of keeping everybody in the room. And then you can do your parent dances before or after the meal period. So there's lots of ways to do, do this. There's no wrong way. Yes? So you said, you said that this, this order that you're saying is generally how they do it down south? This is just a typical order. It, it's no, not necessarily cast in stone. The real important thing that I was going to get to, and thank you for pointing me to that, is that you want to do the reception the way your client visualizes it. Now, your brides may fall into three categories. They know exactly what they want, and they'll tell you. They have an idea, but they would like to get some creative input from you. And then the third part is they don't have a clue, and you have to tell them. So you have to start collecting a lot of information, which brings us to our next slide. Um, first of all, we want to get the names and contacts of all the other professionals that, that we have. And yes. I'll tell you exactly why that's very important. Um, when you make contact with your client, and they tell you, OK, we have a reception that's going to go from 6 to 10. The first thing you want to do is understand your landscape. We have a slide that's going to show that. And I'll, uh, but we're going to get specific song choices, email addresses, and phone contacts from, from the bride and groom. Make sure that we know the name and contact of the venue we're going to play. And that's going to be a very important part of your networking and communication with your other vendors. Finally, names of everybody that you're going to introduce, including any parents. And make sure you don't get the names, but you understand how to pronounce those names, too. The other important thing is to find out when your other vendors are starting and stopping service. And probably the most important one there would be your photographer. Um, I don't know about your part of the country, but in my part of the country, we have a lot of packages. And photographers will book between four to six hours of time, which means they are bridging the ceremony at the church and the reception which means that they may be leaving before the end of the evening at the reception where you are playing. This directly affects your ability to schedule. And you have to know this information. Uh, and one of the first lessons I learned about that was that the very first one I did. The photographer left halfway through the reception and didn't get the bouquet and garter and didn't get the last dance and didn't get a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, if I had known that, I would have front-loaded this reception with a lot of those activities if that's what they wanted. And in some cases, they're paying the photographer way more than they're paying us, which is unfortunate and hopefully something that you will be able to do to elevate your game by providing these services. But the key is to make sure that you understand the landscape while well, all your other vendors are going to be contracted to do their thing from a certain point in time to an end point. So if you know all that information, it really helps you out quite a lot. Go ahead. Next thing we have is specific song choices, and it goes back to the planner, and also what does the bride want? Is there going to be a father-daughter dance? You absolutely must have a song. Of course, there's going to be a first dance. 98% of all wedding receptions I've ever done has had one. I've actually had two in the last five years that they did not want it. So I found that rather interesting. And is there a mother-son dance? Are there any special parent dances? Did your bride and groom go to college and attend a fraternity and sorority? And are they going to have any of their brothers or sisters? Because there may be a specific fraternity song or sorority song that they used as their theme and want to play that at some point during the evening. Make sure you do a thorough job of finding out what their hot buttons are as far as their specific song goes and get the songs. And if it's early enough and it's something incredibly oddball, don't be afraid to ask your client, do you have a copy of that? I've looked around on the internet, don't see it. Do you have that in something you can provide to me? 
you may want you definitely want to get the name of the person that's giving a blessing if you're in the northeast and it's a full-blown catholic wedding chances are you may have someone there from the church after they do the receiving line that wants to bless the food in the southeast it's going to be a minister it's going to be a baptist preacher it's going to be some sort of church official sometimes you may discover that the person that performed the ceremony and that's doing the blessing may be a relative of the bride and groom we get a lot of that in the atlanta metro area and also up in north carolina out west um, there are definitely new age religions and somebody may have a very special blessing that they would like to do before any food is served at that particular occasion also get the names of the parents if your bride and groom would like them to be recognized in some special way, make sure you have that information available and you generally collect that at the same time you're getting the wedding party information. They may come in as part of the big introduction, but if you have elderly parents that are being dealt with, the bride and groom may choose to instead just have them stand up at the table or just introduce them and everyone claps for them. And also, ask your bride, ask your groom, how do they visualize the day? What did they dream of when they were kids, wanted to get married? What was running through their mind? How did they see everything? Try to pull them out of it. It's an interview process on their end to find out about you, but it's also an interview process on your end to find out as much information as possible about what is running through their mind. The more stuff you can get from them, the less chance you have of having some weird oddball thing thrown at you the day of the reception. Along those lines, one of the things that can happen when you ask them, well, how do you visualize the day? They get the deer in the headlight look, and they don't really understand what you mean. So get a little specific. Well, after you get introduced, do you want to sit down and eat right away? Are you going to be hungry or do you feel some pressure to get the dance floor open and do your first dance? So getting an idea of how they want to start things off. And 50% of the time you're going to get a bride and groom who says, well, I want to go ahead and get that first dance out of the way because my parents and my grandparents are there and we want to get this just perfect right at the beginning so that if they get tired, they can go home early. And then you've got other folks that say, you know what? It's a long day and we will have been out there at it for six hours and we want to sit down and eat. So they may say, we don't want to do a dance until after we've actually had a chance to sit down and eat. So if, if you ask that question, how do you visualize the day and you get the deer in the headlights look, there's some examples of what you can do to kind of drill down and understand exactly what they want. Okay. Collecting information, finding out who's going to be introduced. Um, I don't know about you, but um, for those of you who've done weddings, how many of you have had a wedding where you've had uh, either deceased parents or you've got what I like to euphemistically call extended families where you have multiple parents, step parents? Okay, this can be really touchy. The very first wedding I ever did, I had a, a, an ex mother come in and she was not very happy about anything and she was paying for a part of it. She marched right up to me and said, I don't like the music that's being played. Put this CD in and it was all Celtic music. And of course, after 30 minutes, everybody was just snoozing. So what you need to do is understand that landscape and ask your client, how do your parents and your step parents feel about being introduced and walking in? And you may find out that there's a lot of tension there. And, and your job is to run through that and make absolutely sure that everybody's happy about that and don't get caught in the middle. Uh, sometimes you can get caught in the middle of these things and they want you to make the decision. No, don't do that. You ask them, I will, you tell them, I will introduce them any way you want, but I want you to talk to them and see how they want to do this. And more often than not, you'll find that 50% of the time, the exes are okay with coming in. Uh, sometimes they